Hello, hello. Our second and final podcast in our East Asia series this week focuses on the Ming and the Qing. So as you can see right off the bat, the Qing have expanded China quite a bit, um, even outside traditional borders today. Pretty impressive. All right. And under the Qing, you can see their homeland, which will be pretty important later. Notice Manchuria is the region they are in, where they are by 1644, and then moving on either tributary states, areas they've acquired, or where they have expanded out to. All right. So let's talk about decline of the Ming. The Ming dynasty was founded in 1368 that replaced the Mongol Yan dynasty. And the Forbidden City in Beijing was the center of the Confucian social order. The Ming viewed foreign states in a hierarchical manner. And early 16th century was very stable and prosperous. The examination system provided competent officials at local, county, and imperial levels. The Ming bureaucracy, however, was expensive to maintain and it required an efficient system of tax collections. The cultural brilliance and economic achievements of the early Ming continued up to 1600, but at the same time, a number of factors had combined to exhaust the Ming economy, to weaken its government, and cause a technological stagnation. The Ming kept a conservative class system in which each family was assigned a type of labor and required to do it for a fixed number of days annually. It's comparable to the Mita system under the Inca. Some of the problems of the late Ming may be attributed to a drop in annual temperature between 1645 and 1700, which also may have contributed to the agricultural distress, migration, disease, and uprisings of the period. Climate change may also have driven the Mongols and the Manchus to protect their productive lands from Ming control and to take more land from the Ming borders. This is especially important with the Manchus because they are the ones who formed the Qing dynasty. The flow of New World silver into China in the 15 and early 1600s caused inflation in prices and taxes that hit the rural population particularly hard because if you remember, farmers had been used to paying their taxes in goods, they now had to pay in silver. In addition to these global causes of main decline, there were also internal factors particular to China. These included disorder and inefficiency in the urban industrial sector, um, and a great example would be ceramic factories, no growth in agricultural productivity, and low population growth. The Ming also suffered from increased threats. To the north and west, there were emergent Mongol federations, while Japanese pirates plagued the southeast coast. Manchu forces represented an internal threat. Rebel forces led by Li Zicheng overthrew the Ming in 1644, and the Manchu Qing Empire then entered Beijing, restored order, and claimed China for its own. A Manchu imperial family ruled the Qing Empire, but the Manchus were only a small proportion of the population and thus depended on a diverse people for assistance in ruling the empire. Chinese people made up an overwhelming majority of the people and the officials of the Qing Empire. So to wrap that up and summarize, the fall of the Ming can be attributed to internal economic collapse, the flow of silver and tax policies, disruption of trade, an extravagant lifestyle of the imperial family, declining efficiency of the government, a series of famines in the early century, peasant revolts everywhere, external invasions. The Manchu invaders easily defeated the Ming and they were able to establish the very long lasting Qing dynasty, 1644 to 1912. All right, establishment of the Qing rule from 1636 to 1661, and then it gets really interesting. The Manchu originated in the steppes northeast of China beyond the Great Wall. Ming leaders of China actually recognized the Manchu as a neighboring state and sent gifts. In the 1590s, the Ming used Manchu armies to repel a Japanese invasion. And this forced the Manchus to centralize under one ruler who called himself the Qing Emperor, ruler of the Qing Dynasty. In 1644, Chinese rebels took Beijing and the last Ming Emperor committed suicide. Qing rulers incorporated Confucianism and Chinese scholars into the government. Manchus also sought the survival of their own culture. 
Chinese culture was retained, although men were forced to cut their hair in the Manchu style, which was a shaved forehead with a long braid. The Emperor Kangxi established the stability of the Qing dynasty. He reigned from 1661 to 1722, and there was the fear of a Russian-Mongol alliance. In order to stabilize and secure his position, especially to the north, Emperor Kangxi no negotiated a treaty with Russia for control of the Amur River, which is the Treaty of Nurchinsk, in 1689, and brought Inner Mongolia directly under Qing control by defeating Mongolian leader Galdan in 1691. In 1689, the Treaty of Nurchinsk was signed, and under this, the Qing recognized Russian claims to Mongolia, while Russia recognized Qing claims to Eastern territory. With this treaty, Russian Orthodox priests joined Jesuit priests in Beijing, although neither were very successful at converting to, uh, the people to Christianity. Whoops, sorry guys, one slide too soon. Qing China expanded its boundaries using gunpowder, weapons, and the banner system. In other areas, diplomacy was used to extend power. The Qing saw China as part of a larger Manchu, not a Chinese empire, and the Manchus did not attempt to spread Chinese culture to their empire. Maps labeled Chinese areas in Chinese. Everything else was in Manchu. There we go. All right. <laughs> so we have trade and foreign relations. The Qing were eager to expand trade, but... They wanted to control it, to be able to tax it a bit more efficiently, and to control, read, eliminate, piracy and smuggling. To do so, the Qing designated a single market point for each foreign sector. The market point for those coming from the South China Sea, and that includes various European traders, was the city of Canton. And this system was actually referred to as the Canton system. It worked fairly well until the late 1700s. The Qing could not use their tributary system to deal with the growing European presence, and emperors viewed oceanic trade with suspicion. The British, in particular, were incredibly put off by the Chinese limitations on trade. This is going to cause some problems. Um, later on in Unit 5, we'll be discussing the Opium Wars. This is how it starts, guys. In the late 1700s, the British East India Company and other English traders believed that China's vast market held the potential for unlimited profit, and they thought the Qing trade system, again the Canton system, stood in the way of opening up some new paths for commerce. <clears throat> At the same time, the British Parliament was worried about the flow of British silver into China, and they were convinced that opening the Chinese market would help to bring more English merchants into trade and to bring about the end of the outmoded and nearly bankrupt East India Company. In 1793-94, to 94, the British King George III sent a diplomatic mission led by Lord George McCartney to open diplomatic relations with China and revise the trade system. The McCartney mission was an epic failure. And as were similar diplomatic embassies sent by the Dutch, the French, and the Russians. And again, foundations, guys. Foundations. Think of what is to come. All right, our last slide is population growth and environmental stress. The peace that was enforced by the Qing Empire and the temporary revival of agricultural productivity due to the introduction of American and African crops, contributed to a population explosion that brought China's total population to between 350 to 400 million by the late 1700s. Population growth was accompanied by increased environmental stress, naturally. Deforestation, erosion, silting of river channels and canals, and flooding. The result was localized misery... <clears throat> migration, increased crime, and local rebellions. While the territory and population of the empire grew, the number of officials remained about the same. <clears throat> uh -oh. The Qing depended on local elites to maintain local order, but they were unable to enforce tax regulations, control standards for entry into government service, or prevent the declining revenue, increased corruption, and increased banditry 
in the late 1700s. However, while this is going on in the lower Yangtze River Valley near Nanjing, cotton textiles became a major industry. The cotton industry reinforced traditional gender roles and relationships, and Chinese women were expected to work with their hands. But as women began to spin and weave more cotton, they spent less time in the fields and more and more time inside, enabling them to stay in the women's quarters. Cotton production benefited the family economy, though, not the women who were actually weaving the fabric. All right, so our map, wrapping it up, take a look at cultural groups. Pretty important. Um, to this day, many people refer to themselves ethnically in terms of Chinese as being either Manchurian or um, Han Chinese, two languages spoken. Um, Cantonese is very popular, but as is um, Manchurian Chinese. So other groups that are here, pause it if you need. Otherwise, moving on to our conclusion slide. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. Shoot me an email. Happy to help. Otherwise, have a great night, folks. Cheers.